Hello and welcome to our third virtual Moth Morning. This week we have two new guest Moth recorders, Brian Hancock um, and Steve Benner. Both live within the Arnside and Silverdale AOMB. Brian is an expert on the pug moths found in the UK. Steve has been moth trapping since moving to the AOMB a few years ago and he regularly helps out with moth trapping at RSDB Leighton Moths. And lastly, I will show a few moths that I've found since our last meeting whilst I've been out and about. Our first presentation is from Brian. Right, so this lockdown year has given me uh, an opportunity to do something I've done very little of before, and that is um, trying to breed pugs from eggs to right through to pupae and hopefully next year an adult, because you do need to fuss over them quite a lot. And if you go away for a week or more, you're gonna you'll be in trouble. Um, so this has been an unrivaled opportunity to try and breed some pugs. So these are th three, four common garden pugs, green pug, Fox love pug, brindle pug, current pug, but uh, time is limited, so I'll just stick to about two pugs. First of all, common pug. Now, um, people very rarely find the caterpillar of the common pug. Um, nobody quite knows why. It's said to perhaps feed on uh, withered leaves at the bottom of hedges and so on, but it's a very common pug, so it's surprising we never come across the, the caterpillar by chance. So I've, I've, my first challenge was to breed this one through and have a look at the caterpillars. So first you catch your pug, which uh, there are plenty in my garden. Next thing is to decide, is it a male or a female? Look at the underside and clearly that one's a male and there's a female. Then I put them into a box, the females, with some a variety of leaves, which I think they might choose with the book, say hawthorn, blackthorn, all sorts of things, polyphagus, but I give them a, a fair chance. And if I'm lucky, I get some eggs. And there they are on the tip of a hawthorn leaf. And then this is the kit I use. Keep them on my desk, actually. I keep them in little, little boxes. Um, you need a magnifying glass, four steps for handling the foliage, because I've got every other day, I take out the foliage, identify the moths, carefully put them back onto fresh foliage uh, with a new clean tissue underneath. And you use this little paintbrush for transferring very tiny ones that seem to have got a bit lost where you want to put them on what you think they want to eat. So I've got quite a few on the go here and they're all labelled. And here's a, when they get bigger, I put them in a larger pot. There are actually three pugs there, I think, in the middle. These are common pugs. Now you can see after two days, you get a lot of frass. You can see quickly whether they're feeding or not, even when they're tiny, by looking for the frass. If you haven't got frass, you've got a problem. Uh, are the wrong food or they're just unhappy, unhappy for some reason. So that's what it looks like after two days. So take all that out, identify the, the pugs, put them back in a clean pot, and I take photographs as they go along. So here's a common pug with a little first inside just after it's hatched. Then it's getting a bit bigger and you can see the, some markings, typical pug markings begin to appear. A little bit later, oh, that's funny, there's one missing. Oh no, and there, the final, final stage. There's quite distinctive pug markings. Interesting though, we've never, I've never seen that before, so that's nice. And then a few days later, you'll get one. This is pre, before turning into a pupa. And there's the pupa. And then I, interesting, the first one turned into a pupa when there were still adults flying in the garden. And I wonder if uh, one of these might come out as a second generation, because they, they, they do have second generation to the south of England. So I get, then put them into pots like this, into um, a bit of compost, a bit of moss, drop them in there with a label, um, cover them with netting and string, leave them outside in a fairly dry bit of shelter, uh, and hopefully, when a pug emerges, either later this year or next year, I've got a nice little pot like, you can see it there on the, on the netting. And you get a perfect specimen. Now, I've tried one more. I'll show, I'll show you one more, much more tricky pug, quite a rare one, the time pug. 
So first of all, you've got to find your time, or what's time pug. And whenever, I think, wherever you can find a good patch of time like this, this is in um, Coatstones and Wharton. It's old slag from, uh, from an ironworks uh, in the Victorian times at Carnforth. And there's abundant time there. And if I go with a net at dusk, I can quite often pick up, um, well, if I go in June, I always pick up time pug there. Looking at the distribution, um, this is Cumbria, Lancashire, Cheshire. You can see it, it's um, a few, the green ones are old records and the red ones are post 2000. There are a few scattered, only a few for Cumbria, nothing for Lancashire, or well, there's one old one from Gate Barrows. But since we've been looking in the limestone areas, we've found it quite freely. Um, but it, what you wouldn't expect it in the lowlands. This pug does actually spread into gardens. I've had it in my garden. Paul Daunter's had it in his garden. Steve Benner's had it in his garden in Storth. So uh, it's a rare garden visitor, a wanderer probably from its main site. Now this one, now there they I got some little eggs on the thyme. There they are. But to um, breed this one, I've tried a different technique of putting a potted thyme plant I bought in the garden centre into a little cage with two female moths in there and just left them to get on with it um, and took the pot out about after about actually two weeks and I found, to my pleasure, there were some caterpillars. And there is a little thyme, bug caterpillar on the thyme. And I've managed to keep on feeding them and here's a lovely, almost adult one, which got lovely um, sort of purple stripe that matches the colour of the flowers. So again, that's a first for me. I've never seen a time pug larva. I don't think many people have. It's, there's not one on the UK moths uh, site. So that's a nice uh, first for me. And unfortunately, for reasons I don't understand, they're not doing well. I'm only left with one. Uh, I've been giving them fresh time every other day, but even so, I've lost, I started with about 10, and I'm down to one. And I don't understand why, because I think I'm doing everything right. So how are we for time, Justin? Just a couple more? Yeah, you're all right, carry on. Yeah. Um, just to show you briefly, the, the others I've bred this through this season, all from the garden. v Pug, you're probably familiar with that one, comes out in April, my second generation in August, September. I got, uh, actually only got about two eggs from this one. And I bred it on um, apple blossom. Again, the books don't give it, it's, a, it's polyphagous. It means it eats all sorts of things and it's difficult to know what to give them, but I gave them apple blossom. And what's fascinating is that um, the color of the pug, of the larva matches the food plant. Because if you look, it, Ben Smart sent me a photo of a um, bee pug, which is perfectly green, feeding on some green foliage. And I think it's well known that um, caterpillars do, often mat the color matches the food plant they choose. So that's an adult fee pug, and there's the pupa. I've got that in the pot. I'm hoping that will come out. Can I just ask Brian, um, yeah. did you purposefully choose the apple blossom to try and influence the coloration of the larvae? No, no, I just thought um, it was one of the, the um, food plants listed. I thought, well, I've got plenty of apple blossom, so I'll give it to it. Clematis is another one, but there's no, anyway, it just, um, that's how it turned out. Now, the other one I'd, ne I'd never seen was brindle pug. Now, that's a regular visitor in March to my garden. I got eggs. Interesting, I gave it to oak, not oak leaves, but the buds of oak before that actually opened. Um, and it must have laid the eggs in the crevices in the, in the oak buds because I never saw the eggs. But I just, you've got to, that's why you need them in front of you on your desk. Look every day until you see little tiny ones moving around and then um, carefully transfer them onto another healthy oak bud because of course they're laying their eggs on on some plants by the time they hatch out the plants with it so it, it the tricky part is transferring the little baby caterpillars onto the um onto preferred food plant and that's where i use the paintbrush anyway these these did quite well and i got through about uh three pupae there interesting the first when it first pupates is quite pale and after a few days they get turned dark so they, those are now in a pot but they won't emerge until next March, I expect. Another um, grey pug is a common visitor to the garden. Uh, eggs obtained fairly easily onto Hawthorne. And this is a baby one, first in star, and then a middle in star where it's beginning to get some characteristic markings, but lots of little hairs. And there's the final one. 
um, that actually that's been growing much more slowly and it's only just I think it might have pupated today I haven't had a look it was just turning into a pupa yesterday or two of them were and the final one I've done is mottle pug and that's laid eggs on hawthorn nice little stripy caterpillar um, this one I've been a bit disturbed because it's been growing incredibly slowly and I'm thinking <coughs> I haven't given it the right food because it said they say hawthorn or uh, rowan uh, and possibly other things too anyway I've stuck with hawthorn and then I read in the in the pug bible the, the big book on pugs that the mottled pug larvae grow very very slowly and actually prefer withered leaves so perhaps I haven't been doing the right thing or I just have been impatient so I've got a couple of them still on the go and I hope I'll get a pupa soon and I think that's the end of my presentation so that's what I've been doing in lockdown thank you very so, much Brian. If you are interested in finding out more about pug moths, then Brian's book is available upon request. The next presentation is from Steve. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Steve. Um, I've been asked to uh, share some of the moths that I've been getting in my garden in recent weeks. Um, just to um, give you the context, uh, as Justine said, we're um, like Brian up in the AOMB, uh, just outside Arnside. Um, my garden is located here. Um, car bank. Nice environment. We've got, um, we're really half a mile or so um, from Arnside Moss. So we've got the moss just, just across the road. Lots of woodland around us, um, fair amount of woodland in the garden, um, but also backing onto the Teddy Heights Nature Reserve, um, which is 10 acres of mixed woodland and meadow. So Seeing, uh, seeing plenty of woodland species and not very far from, from gate barrows. Um, we do get a lot of uh, really interesting special moths up here, but I wasn't going to show those today because I thought it would be more interesting to, um, to just stick to the ones that, you, you, that many of you are likely to get in your own gardens. Um, this one is yellow tail, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, it's a moth that's been around a couple of weeks now, but I'm still getting it quite quite regularly. Um, named obviously for the, um, the yellow hairs on its tail. Uh, if you've disturbed one of these, they stick their tails in the air. Um, <coughs> the, the idea is that they, those hairs are very um, irritating for predators, so stick its tail in the air, get a face full of that, hopefully it scares them away. Um, but a nice moth. Get them. Um, this is another moth, I'm sure you will know this, recognise it at least, the swallow-tailed moth. Um, this is one of those moths that, unless you trap, you probably never see. They're, they're very secretive during the day, so they're not a day flyer at all. Um, they fly quite late in the day as well. Uh, so if you're one of those people who just goes out doing a uh, light and sheet, uh, or, or even just packs your trap up and and, and takes it in when you go to bed, as I know some people do for odd reasons. You may never see this moth, um, but it, it's a lovely distinctive moth. Um, I'm not getting them in huge numbers. Um, I only had one so far this year. Uh, that's often typical uh, for this area. Um, this is a moth that's actually quite common. Um, it's, it's just appeared for me in the last week, um, shaded broad bar. The, um, what was I going to say? I can't remember. Uh, it's, it's a moth that uh, is also out during the day. It's, it's obviously quite common at the moment because I've had two or three friends send me photographs and I've seen this flying around at Gate Barrows. Can you tell me what it is? Um, so it's a moth that, that is, uh, is quite common. I'm sure you'll be getting this to your traps if you haven't had it already, um, really on the increase at the moment. It seems to be very common this year. Um, Wainscots. This is um, smoky wainscot, which is reasonably common in gardens. Um, I get a lot of it because I've got a lot of grass. Uh, it is a grass feeder. It specialises on coarse grasses. Um, so quite common in, in gardens, particularly if you, if you let some of your grass go a bit coarse around the edges of your lawn or um, in the, uh, just in your borders. Um, there is a confusion species, um, which uh, it's common up here because it's a, a wetland specialist. The moth over on the right there, the, the southern wainscot, very similar moth to smoky. 
Um, it's not, nothing like as numerous uh, as smoky. Um, I say it's mostly a wetland specialist. So uh, if you're close to wetland, you'll, you'll get it. Um, we see it a lot, obviously, at Lake and Moss. Um, they're quite easy to separate in reality. Um, Southern has this very distinctive arc of, of black dots uh, across its wing. Um, although, obviously, they often fade, you don't notice them. So the easiest way of actually separating these two species is just look them in the face, um, have a look at the front. You see the smoky wainscot is, is nice, uh, clear, um, plain fringe, whereas Southern has this very distinctive um, black headband. So that's the easiest way of separating those. It's odd because textbooks often tell you to look at the different colors of the underwings. And actually, I don't know about you, but I find trying to persuade a moth to let me see its underwings is, is not something I like spending my time doing. Very common moth at the moment. This is probably one of the commonest in my trap. Uh, it's actually more common in my trap than uh, large yellow underwing. Um, small fan footed wave. When it's distinctly marked like this one, they're, they're very easy to, uh, to identify. Uh, I find these vary hugely in size. Um, you can get them, the books say two centimeter or so wingspan. I find I get them a lot smaller than that. Um, they can be quite irritating to try and, try and identify, particularly also in the smaller specimens. I find the markings are a lot less distinct. So you may find these, it's just the four black dots in the, in the on, on a, distinctive black dots on each wing that actually give you the clue as to what, as to what they are. Um, and there are quite a few confusion species when you've got badly marked moths. Clearly marked moths are, are fine, but um, when they get badly marked, single dotted wave can often look like one. Uh, if you're in an area where single dotted is, is uncommon and small fan foot is, is, is more numerous. It's quite easy to overlook these single dotted waves. Um, but that, uh, that black splodge in the tonal area of the, of the forewing uh, is usually enough to get you there, plus the different wing shape if you look carefully enough to. Uh, and up here, this, the Mullen wave, not very numerous. It's a coastal species, a limestone species as well. So we do get them. I get them quite a lot in my garden. Uh, and a worn one of these, can, uh, it's very easy to, to, to mistake that for, for single dotted wave as well. Just, uh, just looking at micro, a couple of micros very, very quickly. Um, I think this is my commonest moth at the moment. Um, we've got a lot of bird cherry around us. This is uh, bird cherry ermine. It's about the only one of the Eponymuta species that you can actually safely and, and uh, comfortably identify. Uh, it's got a longer wing length than most of them, so that's the first clue. Um, five rows of black dots. The one on the, 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 uh, the more dorsal one, this, this row here, um, a minimum of eight dots, usually 10, 11. Um, but, but those five, five row of black dots and on the very distinctive, um, extensive row of black dots on the top separate it from all the other Hipponymuta species, which look much more like this. Uh, as you see, the, the row of dots there, there's only five there. Um, <clears throat> and these species are, you can't get these down to species level. Um, Eponymuta is about as good as you can get. Three species this could be. Well, actually, probably somebody would argue that there's probably only two that could be, because there's lots of arguments as to how much the gray fringing uh, along the trailing edge of these wings, each of these species actually ever has. There's also people who will tell you, well, if you count the segments in the antennae, that'll get you down to species level. Um, because if there's 50 to 50, 50 to 70 something, it's, I mean, I don't know these numbers because I am not counting antennae segments, I'm sorry and all that. Um, I, there's a minimum of 50 segment, uh, segments on, on the antennae anyway. It can go up to 80. I don't think I can reliably count that many segments. Uh, my day's too short. And, and it doesn't get you very much closer anyway, because there's a huge overlap. 
Um, so most people say, well, one way of separating these is on, on the amount of gray fringing. Spindle ermine never has any at all. Um, but uh, I think it's apple uh, only ever has the silly silly eye that are, that are, are tinged gray and the, the gray suffusion up, up where it starts on the wing is mostly an orchard. Um, there are others who dispute that. Um, you can't separate these by um, genital examination either, so dissection is no use. And the really only way to be sure as to what these are is to beat them out of a tree um, as a larvae or spot them in their massive larval webs that they, that they tend to fill the trees with. Um, so once it's an adult, you really can't tell. So the best you can do with this is say that's possibly orchard or apple ermine. Um, and the one that hasn't got any gray fringing on the end, a gray suffusion on the wing, that's either orchard or spindle, but you really know closer. So um, I don't waste time worrying, I just, uh, just ag them. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Steve. Lastly, here are a few day flying moths I've found recently. Okay, so everything that I'm going to show you, I've found whilst I've been out and about, um, not all moths found during the day are true day flyers, but some will move if conditions are right or they will fly if you disturb them. So the first one is... Um, black neck and I didn't buy well I didn't spot this I was out uh, looking for um, other species and uh, somebody else spotted it and um, so I thought I'd, I'd use that but black neck is a species that is moving north um, and it's becoming reasonably common in the northwest turns up every now and again in traps but it prefers uh, grassy areas quite wet habitats uh, I think it's quite frequent at Leighton Moss uh, had it at Silverdale Moss um, but this one was from Hesham Moss the larvae feed on tufted vetch so it's quite a um, common plant um, so yeah it's quite a nice moth Second one, so I didn't find this recently. This is the only one that I've not found in the past few weeks. Its flight period is sort of mid-May to June. Um, but I thought it was a nice one to show. So this is quite a common species on the limestone pavements uh, around the AOMB. Um, and it is um, a very strict Day flyer. I don't think I've ever found it in a trap, despite trapping on some of the limestone pavements quite frequently. The larvae feed on wood sage, which is a very common plant out in the open. Um, and they're, they're just a nice moth species. The one in the tube, the very poor looking photograph with the name above, that's my picture. They're quite difficult to photograph. You've got to either be stealthy and watch them land or catch them. Um, and neither is, neither is easy. Now, a lot of moths, like I say, fly during the day or are disturbed, fly at night, but you can find them at rest on walls or vegetation quite often. So the grey dark dagger aggregates, which can't be separated by the adult, but can be by larvae, um, quite nice this one was found on the wall at westgate primary school so uh, my son's been going back to school for the past four weeks he's just broken up again but as i've walked around to collect him i've been finding moths on the wall so i found this was one of the last ones that i found but i found a few other species like poplar gray um single dotted wave uh, a few scoparia um and they, they stand out, especially on the white background. Um, and I, I don't quite know why they're all attracted to that particular wall, but they were. So that was quite nice to find. Um, silver Y. So these are really, really common throughout. So they're a migratory species. Um, just turning up in about March, April. 
Um, the picture on the net, the really bad one, is mine. And that one I found near Coldwell Lane in Silverdale. Um, and you just see them zipping around all over the place. They'll fly during the day, they'll fly during the night. Um, and the larvae feed on pretty much anything, I think. Um, and they're quite distinctive, the nice silvery Y marking. So they're quite common. You find them all over the place, really, um, and regularly turn up in the trap. Another one that flies during the day or at night and is often seen in quite large numbers is uh, the diamond bat moth or Plutella xylostella. That's another migrant. Uh, the larvae feed on brassicas. Um, I found one at the beginning of the year. Well, I found a larvae. They make uh, a little net when they pupate and I had it on broccoli. So when I took the broccoli out of the fridge, um, the adult emerged in the kitchen within about 20 minutes. So I think it was just waiting for the right conditions. Um, but you, you find these all over the garden during the day. Um, Argyresia godartella. This was, so I spotted it along the River Loom. So I was just walking along. Uh, I was looking on some alder. I was looking for leaf mines, uh, and just spotted this, just sitting there, as they normally do. But they fly during the day, um, quite commonly netted around the larval food plants, which are alder, and birch. I think Steve might want to correct me, but I think the larvae feed in the catkins. I think you can find feeding signs in spring. Um, and the diagnostic features of this little brassy coloured Y, upside down Y. Um, I think there is one other species that looks similar. I think it's Argyresthia brochila. I, I think that's pronounced right. Um, but I think the upside down Y is distinctive in this. Um, Another terrible photo, sorry. <laughs> so this is Eucosma campaliliana. Uh, I found this looking for loon hornet moth again, just spotted it as I was going past. And it was at rest on its larval food plant, which is ragwort. And they turn up frequently um, to light. I've had them a couple of times, but they, they don't turn up all that often. I think they, they always seem to have quite a narrow flight period. Uh, but that one, it was lovely and fresh. And my favourite day flying moth that I found this year is the lunar hornet moth. So these guys look very similar, as, you, as the name suggests, to, to hornets, wasps. So to anybody who doesn't know much about moths would think that they have a wasp or a hornet flying towards them, when in fact um, they're quite docile. And to find these, we use pheromones to lure them in. So a new one has been um, made by, well, I can't remember who's made it. I think it might have been Canterbury University, but they're sold by... Um, Anglian Lepidopteris supplies and you take your lure out to ideal habitat um, in this case the lunar hornet moth feeds on salix so willows the larvae bore into to the wood and eat the wood uh, and within about five minutes or so this this turned up um, to the lure and sat quite nicely and altogether, I found four during the day. So uh, it was really a really nice find. Um, I, I should add that there are other species of um, clear wing moth that can be found in a similar way, but we don't really have many of them in the Northwest. I think we've got current clear wing, that's quite common. Um, and a few others, but they're really 
not easy to find and it's all about finding the right habitat to find them off. So did anybody have any questions? Ah, oh, so Steve asked, am, am I using the new law? So yeah, I am using the new law. Um, and I'll just pick up on something that Jane says. So I've already said that the habitat needs to be suitable. And it, in the guidelines um, produced by Butterfly Conservation, they suggest no longer than 30 minutes. Now, personally, I've only been leaving them out for 10 minutes. So I would go to a site, I would uh, produce the law, and if I didn't have one within 10 minutes, I would close, close the pot and move on. Um, if one turned up before that, which in most cases they did, I would then just close it and move on. You just need to know, we're just looking for presence. We're not looking for numbers. We don't need to know that sort of thing. We're just trying to add, um, add to our understanding of the, the distribution of the species. There are a lot of people that are getting these laws and putting them out in the garden and leaving them there for hours. Now, whilst it's great to record these species in your garden, you, you're possibly drawing them away from habitat miles, you know, really unnecessarily. Um, and that's why it's important to, to go directly to the habitat, put them out right next to the larval food plant and spend hardly any time there. Our next session will be held on the morning of the 15th of August. So I hope to see you there. Meetings after this will then be every three weeks. If you have already registered, there is no need to again. You'll receive a reminder in the days leading up to the event. If you would like any further information on moth recording, the following websites are full of useful information to help you out. Alternatively, you can contact me uh, on the email address on the slide. Thank you for joining us.